for the humidification humidification system, we've just seen that it um, uh, looks like a, a, an evolvement of uh, the idea of using the solar still in terms of having the process has been separated. So there is like a component or a device for each process, a humidifier, a dehumidifier and a heater. And then based on uh, the nature of the cycle, the heater can be an, an air heater, it can be a water heater, or maybe a heater for both, depending on uh, how you are going to distribute the energy uh, for, for heating water as well as the air. Uh, just to remind you, the reason for heating is uh, we are using air as a carrier gas. And air ability to absorb moisture increases at higher temperature. That's why we tend to increase the temperature of the air. Not too much, but it's something in the order of uh, maybe 70 to 80 degrees centigrade, which is going to be good enough. We also talked about the, uh, uh, the kind of classification other than the mode of heating air or water. There is uh, the cycle is being uh, a closed loop or an open loop for air, closed loop or open loop for the water. Um, and, and then talking about the cycle being uh, a single stage cycle where we have a single humidifier and dehumidifier or a multi-stage uh, cycle like the ones that have been done by Effect Shafiq for the air heating cycle where we had a combination of heater, humidifier, heater, humidifier, and this combination reached up to four uh, maybe in his latest paper of 2006, he said that the fifth is not needed. I mean, it's not adding much. So four stages of heating and humidification. And finally, uh, the humid air is going to be condensed in the dehumidifier where sweet water is being extracted. So, and, and we've seen some of the layouts of these, uh, of these systems, including what we have done ourselves here in the, in the university, be it experimental uh, or uh, theoretical side. Actually, the theoretical work that we have done, even the experimental work with HDH has extended far beyond what I just mentioned last time. Uh, as we are moving in order, uh, what we see here in front of us is uh, some of the ideas that were patented for um, HDH cycles. The one that we see in front of us, it seems to be something that, that is a, like a normal thing to, uh, to think of because uh, we said that for as, as long as we are talking about thermal desalination systems, then the expectations is um, to, to run the system at a lower pressure. We talked about the issue of having um, the MED and the MSF that we mentioned in the introduction. This, we said that as you are moving from one, uh, stage to the next or from one effect to the next, we reduce the pressure because as the pressure gets lower, uh, there's more vapor that's going to be with, which is like the saturation temperature drops and accordingly you can have more vapor or even you can reach for a saturation condition at a low pressure, which is, uh, which is not very high pressure, very, very high temperature. And so on, water is going to boil at 100 degrees centigrade if we are talking about water at, at atmospheric pressure, but as the atmospheric pressure drops or as the pressure inside the vessel drops, then the saturation temperature drops and then you can reach for boiling at much lower temperatures depending on the pressure that you have. So running the whole cycle at a lower pressure, the figure that we have in the right, if we just uh, draw a vertical line from uh, one of the temperatures here, say that we selected a temperature of 67, and we draw a whole line, a vertical line from this point upward, then you can see that for a pressure of 100, you can reach for a humidity, which is somewhere at around 0.3 kilogram of water vapor per kilogram of air. But if we drop the pressure from 100 to 70, the 0.3 becomes 0.42 maybe. F reducing the pressure further, then you are going almost to double the value or, or approaching as, as 0 0.8, which is double the previous value, which means that the amount of humidity can be increased a lot if you are operating at lower pressure. So running the whole cycle at a lower pressure, which can be done using a vacuum pump or maybe naturally here through, through this famous process that probably if you look at the literature, you'll find that some uh, solar stills have been using the same technology by rising the solar still above the ground, something like 10 meters or so, 
and then creating vacuum inside, and then you have evaporation at lower temperature, and then more water would come in. The problem here is that, or, or maybe practically speaking, I mean, this water, which is the sweet water, which is being formed here, you need to get it out in, um, uh, in, in a regular manner continuously, and you cannot make an opening here, otherwise the air is going to get inside. Remember, inside is a low pressure area. So there's something here, technically speaking, it's not even the issue with the evacuated, with the freezing refrigeration has a similar problem if you are adopting freezing with, uh, with low pressure, like using an ejector or so. That's why another idea came into the picture by considering, um, no, that's, that's another issue. The issue that we have here is related to thermodynamic balancing and by thermodynamic balancing here, we are making connections between the humidifier and the dehumidifier. We have three connections here. We have a single connection here. We have, uh, again, three connections there, but this one is, is a water heated, but this one is a modified air heated cycle. The issue of the thermodynamic balancing is that we are trying as much as possible to bring uh, the entropy generation to the lowest possible value and having a connection between the humidifier and dehumidifier to control what we call the mass flow rate ratio is, is, is one of the, of the factors that work in reducing the entropy generation and accordingly uh, making the unit pro, pro perform better. And we have tested that uh, even experimentally and we found that, that there is some sort of a, uh, a sensed or a substantial improvement in the performance and the gain output ratio can be done by just applying thermodynamic balancing. I'm going to talk about the thermodynamic balancing again uh, in, 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 in describing some of the steps that we have done for, uh, uh, for, for, for operations or improvement of the, of the HDH system. I'm going to get back again to the issue of the low pressure operation, but the, area, the idea of working with variable pressure came into the picture. What is it that we need to operate at low pressure? This is where we need evaporation because at low pressure, evaporation occurs at low temperature. So it's the humidifier basically is what we need to operate at low pressure. So why should we have the whole system at low pressure if it's only the humidifier is what we want it to be in, in this condition? So the idea of variable pressure or varied pressure uh, system is there. So the humidifier is operating at low pressure and, and definitely temperature, whereas the condenser is operating at atmospheric conditions. Accordingly, you can easily extract the water which is being condensed here. But this is going to need a compressor to increase the pressure from the humidifier level to the dehumidifier level. And here we have a couple of ideas. One of them is a mechanical vapor compressor or a mechanical compressor, basically what you do just uh, run a mechanical compressor, which is going to suck uh, the vapor, which is leaving the humidifier, creating low pressure here, whereas it is going to deliver the, uh, the high pressure or the atmospheric pressure, uh, a little above, above the atmospheric pressure of the vapor to the dehumidifier for condensation. And because we have a compressor here, then we have to have an expander here. The expander ideally would be some sort of a turbine-like expander. The worst condition is to have it like um, a throttling valve because the throttling valve is the one which is associated with tremendous increase in entropy. So this is a, a mechanical compressor. The other one is a thermocompressor, which is basically an ejector. And we will be talking about the ejectors a lot during this term because the thermocompressor is a component that once you add it, to some of the conventional desalination systems, it makes um, a substantial improvement in the performance. And we'll see that, talking about um, a single effect evaporation system, without uh, the TVC, the thermal vapor compressor, you will have uh, a, a performance ratio of one, almost one, a little bit less than that. But putting or adding a thermal vapor compressor is going to increase the performance ratio by at least 48%. So this is significant improvement. So talking about a thermal compressor as a tool for increasing the pressure of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the fluid or the air, the humid air, which is leaving 
uh, the humidifier is again some uh, even uh, industrially proved technology to create vacuum by using a thermo vapor compressor. So these were some of the ideas that were uh, brought. Actually, we have designed systems that can work on variable pressure, but we have not yet put that into service. What we have been thinking more is the idea of thermodynamic balancing that I'm going to come up in, in a while. Now what we see here is some sort of a, a comparison of the performance between different systems. The systems that we have here are not recent ones. In the recent ones, you will see them eventually. I can put some, some of our recent papers in, uh, in Blackboard so that you can be able to watch what we have reached for in terms of uh, uh, productivity as well as performance measures for the units. Um, the units that we have here are relatively having uh, small productivity. We're talking about a certain uh, like three liters per meter square, 12 liters, 13 liters per meter square. These are a little bit on the low side. Per day, it means that they are operating be, or, or uh, considering the idea of, uh, of solar energy. So per one meter square of solar energy, it is producing 13 liters which means that it is, we are talking about basically um, a system which is uh, using solar energy. So that's maximum 12 hours per day. And these are the reported, some of the researchers have reported values of the gain output ratio. Some did not do that. Um, these were some of the ideas that were there. Some of the work here basically is experimental work. Some of it is theoretical work and um, uh, actually, the, the information that have been generated later is, is much more than what we see here. This is an overview of the expectations, like a multi-stage air heated cycle, the idea that Rifat Shafiq that I talked about last time has came up with, because air heating is, is basically an inefficient system. So we're talking about a lower uh, or a low goal for this system. But if we are talking about a modified air heated cycle, things improve a lot. And then you are going to have considerably higher gain output ratio. Uh, the best HDH in the market so far is having uh, a goal which is still less than five. The reduced pressure cycle has some sort of a similar uh, goal, but the multi extraction can exceed this value. So the value of uh, the thermodynamic balancing HDH system is substantially higher. The same thing with a the thermo vapor compressor, but the thermo vapor compressor, the greater than five here is theoretical value, as well as the varied pressure. These are basically theoretical values that were not really up to now realized experimentally uh, in, in a lab or a pilot scale. The ideal one, as I mentioned last time, we are talking about 120. This is assuming that everything is reversible, which practically is impossible. But at least that puts a ceiling, like when we talked about thermodynamic engines, about the Carnot cycle. There's no cycle that can, can operate with an efficiency closer to the, to the Carnot cycle, but it is given as some sort of a theoretical limit that we can put in front of our eyes and probably strive uh, increasing the effectiveness or the gain output ratio of the current unit until we approach, let's say, half of this value if we can, or maybe one third of it. Um, the work that we have done, it was an eight year collaboration with, uh, with MIT and one of the uh, graduate students there, a PhD student, is Prakash, uh, he has uh, completed his PhD and then he himself with uh, one of his colleagues who graduated from the chemical engineering department over there, they decided not to search for a job, but create their own company, which is called Gradient. And it's basically adopting the HDH technology. So what we see here in front of us, the two towers of the humidifier and the dehumidifier that are the basic operation of, uh, of the unit. They are adopting the HDH unit here. And basically they are not, they are using it, but as I mentioned once before, it's not for desalination but it is basically for frac water treatment. The HDH technology has the ability to deal with extremely high salinity input. And uh, one of the reasons is that because everything is here is, is plastic, nothing is metal. So we're not worried about corrosion. And accordingly, we can just use um, 
the plastic elements and use whatever quality of water that you have in. They are using basically uh, some sort of solar energy, but not alone, but they are continuing the heating. It's a water heated cycle and they are using uh, natural gas to, uh, to keep on heating a tremendous quantity of fluid which is coming in uh, to the humidifier. That's something about uh, some description of the technology that they have. And I told you probably in our uh, one of our uh, classes of the introduction that uh, the HDH is technically all sorts, technologically is called carrier gas, carrier gas extraction. The carrier gas is the air and the air extracts water vapor from a solution and then delivers it by condensation into another area, which is the dehumidifier to get sweet water in. Okay. Um, what we did next, I mean, that was, I mean, that, that spin off started in probably 2012, 2013 or so. And then after that, we went back, back again to, uh, to the lab to come up with other uh, modifications or other versions of the HDH cycles. So we went back, not only for the lab actually, but even for uh, some um, simulation work to, to take care of, uh, of this cycle. Maybe before talking about uh, our further modifications to the cycle, it is probably a time that we look at uh, the main assumptions that you have for a cycle. The figure that you have here in front of you is basically considering uh, a water heated cycle. And uh, when you look at this cycle, you'll find that we have a closed loop for the air. So air basically is moving from the dehumidifier. It is leaving here at a low temperature saturated, it will enter into the humidifier, it will receive energy from the heated water, so it will be heated, humidified, it will also leave at higher temperature, also saturated, and then the high temperature saturated air is going to uh, enter to the dehumidifier, where it is going to transfer heat uh, to the hot, to the cold water, which is coming here, the cold water is coming in pipes, inside the pipes, and air is passing outside the pipes. So the pipe surface is cold for condensation of the humid air. And then the condensate is going to be collected as a product, whereas the air is going to leave to continue its, uh, its rotation, its cycle, whereas the water is going to get some, hot, some heat from the hot air, and this is energy recovery, and then it will be further heated to the top temperature. So the temperature here basically is the temperature after the heater, water before it is sprayed in the humidifier. This is the hottest portion of it. And then it will be sprayed here. And then we have packing material, structured packing so that we can have the lowest possible uh, pressure losses within the system, providing enough surface area for heat and mass transfer to take place. Some of the water is going to be evaporated, carried by the air as humid air, and the rest that will not evaporate is going to be rejected or thrown away to the surroundings. We may, in one occasion, try to close the loop for the water, but in order to do that, this temperature of the water should be low enough so that it would be effectively condensing the vapor here, the, the, the humid air. Otherwise, if this one is higher in temperature, we cannot reroute it back again as it would, uh, it would affect the condensation process. Now it's time probably to look at the components one by one and uh, do some sort of an energy balance. So what we are going to do basically is rather than going for detailed analysis of each component, Detailed analysis, I would mean that probably somebody can think of a numerical model or analytical model where the humidifier might be looked at as, um, as if it's a cooling tower and, and take it like uh, cutting it into a um, certain number or n number of strips and making an energy and mass balance for each one of these. Or we can look at it as a thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamically closed box and look at the terminals of the box, what's going in and what's leaving out of the unit. And this is basically what, what I'm thinking that we can, uh, we can be better doing for this component. 
So we're going to assume that we have a humidifier. This is the one. This humidifier is receiving hot water in, and it is also receiving uh, this, ho this hot water, part of it is going to evaporate, and the rest is going to leave here. And then also we have air, which is coming here. Air is going to move up, and then the humid air is going to leave the unit where it will it will be uh, after leaving the unit it will be moving into the humidifier uh, to the dehumidifier. So what we have in front of us here basically is the humidifier. This is air in state number one, and this is air out, state number two. And then to keep on with, uh, with the same numbering system, water is going to enter to the dehumidifier as water one. It will receive some energy. It will leave at water two, and then it will pass by a heater. And then here we have water three. where basically this water, which is being sprayed here, droplets are falling down, whereas the air droplets are moving up. And we have sort of uh, packing material so that we can increase the surface area as much as possible for having effective heat and mass transfer process to occur. So this is basically the kind of flows in and out of the humidifier. When we are looking for the balance, then we have both mass balance and energy balance. If I start with the mass balance, then we have M dot air, this is going in plus M dot water, this is going in then actually the air, I'm going to take it out of this part. Why is that? Because we do assume that the dry air quantity is constant everywhere. So what will happen? The water is going to come here and the water is going to leave except for a quantity that will be evaporated and carried by the air. So the dry air quantities does not change into the component, but what changes is that the water, as it enters in, part of it will evaporate and the rest is going to be rejected. Here we call it B stands for brine, which is a salty solution of water. So I can rewrite this equation as M dot water, which is entering here, is equal to m dot brine plus this quantity of the water vapor can equal to m dot air into omega 2 minus omega 1. Omega is the humidity ratio kilogram of vapor water per kilogram of air, kilogram of vapor per kilogram of air. The air cancels with that, and then it becomes the difference of the humidity that has been uh, taken as water vapor. So that's the mass balance for the humidifier. If we are going to consider the energy balance, which is nothing but the application of the first law of thermodynamics, then we can say that sigma energy N minus sigma energy out plus energy generated, we don't have energy generated in the system, is equal to the energy stored that we're assuming it is not there because we are basically working based on a steady flow operation, which means that sigma energy 
in is equal to sigma energy out. Here we have two streams in and two streams out. The streams in are basically M dot dry air, enthalpy of the air at state number one. And we have M dot water, enthalpy of the water at three. These are inlets. The exit is going to be M dot air, H air at two and M dot brine H water at four. Or you may also call it H brine. It's all up to you. So this one, you can call it H water or you can call it H for the brine. So this is the kind of mass and energy balance between them. We know that M dot B, which is this quantity, is nothing but M dot water minus the quantity that has evaporated, which is M dot air into the difference in the humidity ratio between outlet and inlet of the humidifier. Okay, then we might be looking at the other component. The other component for us is the dehumidifier. I would erase this and put that dehumidifier. If somebody has a question, please let me know before I do that. Uh, excuse me, Doctor. Abdurrahman, um, For the M dot air, when the air is leaving uh, the humidifier as a humidified air, mm -hmm. shouldn't it uh, change because it carries water with it as a, and it moves as a humid air? Yeah, but the point is, we said that what we, are, what we are considering in the cycle basically is the motion of the dry air. So when I'm talking about M dot air, I mean the dry air. And then the humid part I'm taking separately here. Oh, okay, okay. Which is basically is this part. Uh, okay. Clear. We may be able to do that while looking at this. For example, when I'm saying here H air one, then I'm considering M dot air as H air one. And in the enthalpy, I'm considering what is the temperature of the air and how much is the air humid. So two properties would be needed here and would be needed here as well. So the issue of how much water vapor carried by the air is going to be considered while we're writing the energy balance. Okay, clear. Then if we are going to move to the second component, so I'm going to clear this and go for um, a dehumidifier. And for the dehumidifier, basically what we have, we have water going in. And we have distillate leaving. Sorry. Yeah, see, let me say that this is leaving from here. And let me erase this. And then we have air coming in and air going out also. So we have basically um, air in and air out. And then we have also seen that this uh, water, so um, for the water, let me do it this way. There is water in that's going to pass inside the tubes of a heat exchanger. Actually, it's a heat and mass exchanger. And this is leaving here and going for the heater. So here we have M dot water and the condition here is water one and this is water two and again the quantity is m dot water here we have m dot air this is the same condition that has left the humidifier so it has the same ma2 and h2 and it will leave here it depends now am i considering closed air cycle or open air cycle. If it's, an, if it's an open air cycle, 
then I would say that this is H air three. Assuming that the humidifier have the inlet is M dot air and H air one, and it's an open cycle. If I need to close the cycle, then this is going to be one, not three, and it will be entering here. So that's in the analysis, if you are going to consider either a closed air loop or open air loop. Let's go for general, the general one and consider that we have an open air loop here. So these are basically the, the kind of, of terms that we have here. We have air in and out, we have water in and out, and then we have a distillate which is, uh, which is leaving here. When we come to the energy, to the mass balance, And this unit basically is the humidifier. The mass flow rate of the water is going to go inside the tube and it will pass inside the tubes and then it will leave the tube. So the same mass flow rate in and mass flow rate out, that's the same thing. So this is M dot, that's why I did not call it M dot water one. It's just M dot water. It's the air actually, which is going to, to change so that the quantity of the distillate, which is this, is going to be M dot air into H into, sorry. Um, omega two minus omega three. So that is what is going to remain out of the uh, balance for the dehumidifier. The distillate that we are going to collect here as a product is basically the quantity of air or the flow rate of air which is passing in, and it is going to lose some vapor, this vapor which is collected to be the distillate. So the value of estimating the product is coming from here. Then going for the energy balance, we are going to do the same thing here. So that sigma energy N is equal to sigma energy out. It's a steady state condition. And the energy N is going to be, we have M dot water into H water one. We have M dot air into H air two. This is inlet. What is leaving? M dot water, H water two. And this is higher because the, the energy recovery has increased the amount of energy associated with the water because heat transfer from the hot air and the latent heat of condensation, they all contributed to preheating the water. That's energy recovery. And we have air leaving, M dot air at H air three. And we have M dot distillate in, into H distillate. Now, in order to be able to solve that, the problems that we are that we are putting here, actually, there's a still there's one one still component I did not talk uh, talk about, which is so for assuming that we have a water heated cycle, then this is going to be M dot water, and this is H water two and it's leaving at H water three, and there is heat given here in the heater, and the heat could be either electric heater or a solar collector or process heater or some sort of waste heat that you have here and there. But anyway, it needs energy uh, to operate, which is M dot uh, water into H water three minus H water two. There's no need for any mass balance because M dot water in and M dot water out. Now, this is the energy balance, mass balance and first law thermodynamics to each component or each one of the three components that we have. Um, maybe um, I, I can switch now to the, to the presentation, which is going to show the same thing. And it may add a little bit to that by writing like a second law analysis. For the second law analysis, we know that the sigma M E S E M N M exit 
S exit, exit is the S is the entropy minus M I S I is equal basically to the entropy generation, assuming that there's no energy transfer uh, with the surroundings. So that that's going to be applied to each one of the components that we have in front of us. And we're going to get that. So we have seen this equation for the humidifier that M dot water minus M dot air into the difference in humidity ratio for the air, which is the quantity that has evaporated, is equal to the M dot brine, which is rejected from the humidifier. And then M dot brine, H water three, this is rejected. M dot water, H water two, which is the ended. Uh, note here that there's a difference between this and what I did on, on papers, because on papers, I code this T water one, and then here we have T water two. T water three, T water four. Here he called it T water zero, T water one, T water two, T water three. You can call it anything, but just be consistent while you are solving the problem in hand or we are analyzing the system that you have in hand. So M dot uh, B H water, this is rejected brine minus this is inlet. So this is energy out. This is energy in associated with the water. And for the air, we have energy in and energy out. So when you put that, you'll find that sigma energy out is equal to sigma energy in. The equation of the second law here, it says that um, S generated or the generated entropy is basically sigma M dot exit S exit. And the M dot exit S exit here is basically three and two. These are in positive. The inlet is M dot water S water two. This is inlet and M dot air S air one, this is inlet. So sigma M dot S exit is equal or minus sigma M dot into S inlet is equal to the entropy generation. So that's the second law equation. Then the same thing is being repeated or this analysis is being repeated for the dehumidifier, showing that the pure water is M dot air into the difference in um, uh, in, in the absolute uh, or humidity or the humidity ratio. And note that here we are considering a closed water cycle. So the conditions for the water cycle as basically states one and two, that's all. In the previous one I drawn, I have shown that we have three because I have broken this line and I assume that I'm taking air from the atmosphere and then air is rejected to the atmosphere. This particular system that we have in hand, they are all connected together. So it's basically a closed loop air cycle. So this is the difference between this. You have the recording of this uh, class today, and then you may compare between both of them. And if you are going to design a system, it's all up to you. Uh, do you want to make it a closed loop or an open, or an open loop cycle? Nothing is going to, uh, to prevent you from doing that, except if you have some sort of weather conditions that would require that. I would remember I was talking, uh, I was presenting uh, in one of the IDA conferences, uh, some work that we have done with HTH system. And I said that I was using an open air loop cycle. And then somebody from the audience, he was coming from Canada. He said, I cannot make an open loop cycle because uh, in winter the temperatures is, is too cold and we cannot just every time look for uh, a, a substantial amount of heat to heat the air. So for them, it was better to make it a closed loop. For me, I was just combining the HDH cycle with a vapor compression system. So we needed the air to be coming from the outside because this air after that is going to be cooled down and entered into a place for conditioning. So it depends on uh, your limitations, local limitations of the environment that you have and to what is it that you wanna do with the cycle. For the dehumidifier again, the energy balance, we have uh, water leaving. So this is M dot into H water leaving minus M dot H water inlet. This is the fresh water which is leaving. And this is again the air which is uh, uh, entering minus the air which is leaving. So again, uh, sigma M dot E H E is equal to sigma M dot I H I. And the entropy, uh, equation or the second law equation here as S generated is equal to sigma M E S E minus sigma M I S I. Now, when we are coming to solve the system, 
then we are going to face a couple of problems. Number one, we should decide what kind of input values that we have to, to use. And number two, what are the assumptions that we are going to make? For example, some of the assumptions that would make sense for a system like the one that we have in hand here. The air that gets into the humidifier is going to leave with a value of the phi relative humidity close to one. So assuming phi equal to one is a valid assumption. here. You have air coming in, hot water is leaving out. So the air is going to reach its saturation condition before it leaves the humidifier. And it will enter with the same saturation condition. And then when it leaves, it will also leave with a saturation condition. Remember that as the air, the humid air is passing here, it will condense over the tubes. Condensation means that you have reached it for the dew point temperature of the water vapor in the air. So the air is basically saturated. So phi is equal to one here and phi is equal to one there, but the omega is not because omega is a function of temperature. And that's why basically we are heating or adding heat to the humidifier. We are entering saturated air, but as you are heating the air, it needs more vapor. It's able to take more vapor there. So the value of omega between this state, state one and state two for the air is going to be different. Omega will not be the same, but phi is the same because it's a relative humidity. It just means that air in this condition and in that condition are basically saturated air. So this is an assumption, phi equal to one and one here. Then we have to come up with what is the temperature of the water which is coming in here and how much is the flow rate. And either you should identify what is the quantity of energy that you are going to add or not talk about the energy, but assume that I need to reach for a maximum temperature of 80 degrees centigrade. So you either specify this or specify that, either how much is Q or how much is the maximum temperature, and then Q is going to be calculated then. Mass flow rate of the water should be given, mass flow rate of the air should be given. So for the air, I just have the mass flow rate and we're assuming that phi is equal to one, and here's phi equal to one in this condition as well. When we do that, we'll find that there are some information that are still missing. The mass flow rate of the air would be given, mass flow rate of the water would be given as a value, but still you find that the number of equations and number, number of unknowns are not matching. They are not the same. This is why we come to the definition of the effectiveness of the humidifier and the effectiveness of the dehumidifier. So this is something that we would come up with to complete the number of equations that we have. And actually this uh, definition of the effectiveness, it has gone through different phases of or, or evolvement. It has been evolving since we started uh, learning or studying the HDH system up to uh, currently, we had just uh, a couple of months ago, we have sent a paper for the energy conversion and management uh, journal where we are coming with a new definition of the effectiveness. And uh, we just, uh, today we got some response that some of the reviewers need some clarification of some of the points that we need to clarify before we submit again. And I'll share that a paper with you once it is uh, once it is accepted, inshallah. Um, the, the idea that it, it carries, as I mentioned, the issue of how the definition of the effectiveness has evolved. And I'm coming to that like a step by step. The heater, Qn, is equal m dot water into the difference. Maybe uh, an acceptable definition you would be, if you say it because this is water, you can say that this is basically m dot water into Cp water into T water two minus T water one. We cannot do that for the air, remember. We can only do it for the water. Why cannot we do it for the air? Because the air is not dry air, it's a humid air. And accordingly, the enthalpy of the air, a substantial part of it is related to the humidity. And this equation does not have humidity. So I cannot write Q, if I'm talking about an air heater, Q air is M dot air Cp delta T in our analysis, this is not accepted. Why not accepted? Because we are dealing with 
with, with humid air, not dry air. So this is one of the common mistakes we normally find when we are analyzing this kind of, uh, of, of systems. Here's the effectiveness. The effectiveness of a unit by definition is the actual change of enthalpy divided by the maximum change of enthalpy. Then the definition would just require us to identify what do we mean by maximum change in the enthalpy. And for this, let me consider the two components. One of them is the dehumidifier. If I'm going to consider the dehumidifier, and the dehumidifier basically has air, which is hot, which is coming at a condition H air two, and it will leave at H air one, talking about the, the closed cycle that we have here in this presentation. And then we have water, which is coming as H water zero, and it will leave as H water one. Now, looking at this system, the actual change of enthalpy we're just assuming that the system is well insulated. It does not exchange heat to the surrounding. So the delta H of the system is basically M dot air, H air two minus H air one. Or I can say that it is also equal to M dot water, H water one minus H water zero. So I can say that. It's balanced and whatever energy that's going to be lost by the air is going to be gained by the water. So this is the actual change of enthalpy. What about the maximum change? The maximum change is associated with a system with infinite area. The system is too huge so that the hot air is going to be given off its heat to the water and then it will leave at the lowest temperature possible. What is the lowest temperature possible in this system? Any answer? Hot air is coming and it is going into colder surface that has the water in. It will keep cooling down. If the system is infinitely large, the lowest temperature of the air will be so, same as the seawater? Yes, same as the ended seawater temperature because this is the cold temperature coming in. So the delta T maximum here from the air side is going to be M dot air, delta H maximum can be M dot air, H air two minus H air ideal. And by ideal here, it means air at T water zero. Or alternatively, I can look at this condition differently. I can say that delta H maximum is M dot water H water, sorry. H water two ideal minus H water one. One is the inlet condition, it's not changing. It will keep on heating to a final exit temperature. If it's infinitely large, then it would approach the temperature of the hot air inlet. So this one is going to be temperature of the water at T air two or H of the water at a temperature equal to T air two. Can the system practically reach these values? The answer is no, but this is the, this is the maximum limit. And this is how we need to identify an, an effectiveness. 
like when we talked about the effectiveness of, of heat exchangers in a heat exchanger course, it was basically the same thing. The only difference is that because for a heat exchanger course, we're basically dealing with liquids and heat exchangers. So it was basically MCP delta T. So the effectiveness was given in terms of temperature differences. Here we cannot do that because basically you are talking about a combined heat, heat and mass transfer components. So for a humidifier, that was basically the condition. And if you have noticed here, the smallest, uh, I'm coming to this in a while, that the differences, we are basically considering the effectiveness as related to the terminal values. By terminal values, I mean the values at the inlet and at the exit of the unit. So I'm comparing this with this, with this. And I'm looking at this with this, or in other words, I'm looking at the differences at the terminals. Am I able to heat the water to this temperature? No, how much is less? Am I able to cool the air to this temperature? No, how much is the difference? So based on the differences in the terminal values, I'm looking at what's, what is the result. Inside the unit, the values are quite big. The air is too hot, the water is too cold, so they approach each other only at the terminals. Air has cooled down so that it gets closer to the water temperature. Water has heated up so it gets closer at the air temperature, but inside the unit, the difference of temperature between air and water in every location is much higher than these values or these values. So the minimum differences, this difference is what we call pinch value. So the pinch temperature difference here in the dehumidifier is found at the terminal conditions, either at the inlet where the two streams are cold, water is coming cold and he and air has already lost its heat and it's going out cold. Or the exit where water has been heated up while the air is coming hot. So here at the bottom, we have both temperatures are cold. We have a small pinch temperature. At the top, both temperatures are hot and we're looking at the pinch difference here. For the, for the dehumidifier, it's pretty straightforward. What I said here is what we are doing and what we shall be doing. There's no problem here because of just this point, which is important to understand now, that the differences that we are looking for are basically at their lower level at the terminals. Water in, air out. Air is being cooled down and water is already cold water out and air in. Air in is coming already hot, but the water out has been heated due to the condensation process inside the dehumidifier. Generally speaking, we are looking for the effectiveness, which is delta H actual over delta H maximum. And I would hope that it is pretty straightforward when we are talking about uh, the dehumidifier case. And then we're going to talk about it for the humidifier. And initially, we're going to talk about the same concept, looking at the terminal and the pinch values. And based on that, we are defining the effectiveness of the humidifier. The GORE or the gain output ratio, we define uh, that the kind of efficiency. Uh, yes. Uh, before we go to the GORE, uh, do we take into consideration the, like, the time, how long does the hot air stay in the dehumidifier? I mean, to reach a uh, higher effectiveness, we could leave it like for longer time to reach near the maximum. Yeah, actually what we do is that we do this operation whenever we reach the steady state condition. So we run the unit and wait for some time until the temperature settles down so that no changes after that. And then we start to do our analysis. It's not a transient sort of thing where we are waiting for to reach a steady state condition and temperatures would settle down. This is after they settle down. And as a matter of fact, I can tell you that almost all the engineering equipment that we are dealing with in the industry are like that. I mean, whenever you are analyzing a furnace, you are not looking at the start up or the shutdown of the furnace. You are looking in between where the furnace is operating and just given its duty in a constant value. Same thing applies for a turbine in a gas turbine or a steam turbine. So we're talking about basically steady state condition where there's no changes that are occurring with time. Okay? Yes, yes, sir. 
I did not leave the effectiveness. I'm going back again and again to, into it. I'm just here because the definition of the gore is there. I'm just mentioning it, that it is the pure water that we are getting into the latent heat of condensation divided by the energy into the system. The definition of the effectiveness is being given here. And you will notice here that I'm given this page for the definition of the effectiveness of the humidifier. In the humidifier, we have air coming in and air leaving. And we have water coming in, which is water at two, and it is leaving here as brine or water three. And when I'm looking for this issue here, here, who's hot and who's cold? Basically, water is hot. And this air is cold. What will happen to the water? Its temperature is going to drop because it's going to be interacting with cold air, which is coming in. And air is going to be heated and humidified. So the temperature of, of the air here is higher than the temperature of air inlet here. If at this moment I take the same concept of definition for the effectiveness as I did for the dehumidifier, I'm going to write it as this, delta H over delta H maximum. And the definition of delta H maximum is going to follow the same thing I did earlier. So that it would be either M dot air into air H A, sorry, H air two ideal minus H air one. H air two ideal is H of the air at water inlet temperature. I know that the air cannot be heated up to the value of W2 unless the unit here is infinitely large, which is something practically you would not do. Or the delta T maximum would be M dot water, H water in minus H water out ideal, which is the brine ideal. Ideal means what? It means the unit is too big so that the energy has lost all the differences of the water here so that it has left at the air temperature. So this is at T water, uh, at T air, one. Then when you are writing your expression of the effectiveness, you should write it either based on either stream. You can write it based on the water stream. So this is basically M dot water in, H water in. This is hot water. It is leaving as H water out, M water out. And the differences are not, are the M water in and M water out are not the same because this is water and this is brine divided by M water in H water in minus M water out ideal. Ideal means what? It means the water has cooled down to the inlet air temperature. Then you can write the effectiveness based on the air side, delta H air over delta maximum, M dot air, H air out minus H air in, M dot air, this is dry air, so it's constant M dot. So it's, I can write this one as uh, M dot, air as H air two minus H air one. I can do that. And this one is going to M dot air. H ideal, I'm assuming the air is going to be heated until it approaches the maximum ever temperature found here, which is this, minus the inlet condition, which is M dot air H air one. Then what we do then, we compare between this value and this value and we take the higher value. And we say that this is the effectiveness of the humidifier. So basically we take effectiveness of the humidifier as the maximum between the effectiveness for the water side and effectiveness of the air side. And we do the same for the dehumidifier as well. You take the highest value. What we do 
Once you do that, then the system is closed. I mean, the, the, the number of equations and the number of unknowns are the same, and then you can go ahead and be able to solve the system. You may be able to solve it simultaneously because basically the temperatures of the air are not known. So you have to, you have to identify them. Air which is leaving the humidifier has been heated to what temperature? Air which is leaving the dehumidifier has been cooled down to what temperature? That depends on the effectiveness value. There's something here I did not mention, by the way, which is when we come to the, to the value of the energy balance for the dehumidifier, what is this? This is the enthalpy of pure water, which is going to condense. The pure water does not condense at a single temperature. Actually, the air comes here as high temperature, so here coming as hot and humid, and it would leave here as cold air. So what will happen? Air temperature will keep on decreasing as it passes through the dehumidifier. And definitely, because it decreases, then the temperature at which the droplets are being condensed is changing. So this cannot be represented by a single value of, of, of the enthalpy. But I'm not doing a numerical analysis or analytic analysis, which I'm cutting this into pieces and looking at each piece to come up with how much is the temperature changing here. So I'm going to make an assumption here by taking some sort of an average value. So we can calculate this H as H of the water at some sort of an average air temperature. And that's actually, this is I mean, an, an assumption which is not bad. How do I'm saying it is not bad? Because we did that and we compared it with the experiments and shows that it's, it's a valid assumption. Or if you wish, you can take enthalpy of water corresponding to the air inlet temperature, enthalpy of water corresponding to the air outlet temperature and take the average. So either you take it at the average air temperature or calculate water enthalpy at this temperature and that temperature and take the average of them. Both values are close and both values will do fine with, uh, with the solution. Now this way you are going to have basically the kind of data or information that you're looking for and you can put the equations together, solve them simultaneously and then you can get your answers accordingly. So that is basically for, for the analysis of, of, of the HDH system per se. Um, what, what I did is that I asked for, um, for having access for you for the, the computer labs. I'm waiting for the ITC to respond to us. So um, we'll try to make an access for every one of you for one of the computers that we have in our computer lab. So that if you cannot come to the, uh, to the, to the computer labs yourself, you should be from your locations you are going to get uh, enabling uh, through the VPN and uh, be able to access the computer remotely where you can run the ES. If you have the ES in, in, with you, that, that would be great. But I assume that you do not. And accordingly, we will try to make it available through this uh, remote uh, access to the computers in our lab so that you can run the system. Uh, this program, for example, has been uh, We've done it several times using uh, the engineering equation solver. And uh, maybe you can see in front of you here, this is a screenshot of uh, a, an energy equation solver program that, uh, sorry, um, ES engineering equation solver uh, for um, a system. The system that we are making here basically is, um, 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 is this. So what we have basically is uh, an, an open air cycle, open water cycle. So air is taken from the atmosphere. It will enter here. It will pass through the packing material where water, hot water is being sprayed in. Air is going to be heated and humidified. And the humid air is going to be, going to be taken from here. And then it will be routed to condense on the outer surface of the tubes that have cold seawater in. Energy recovery is going to occur and the cold seawater, its temperature will keep on increasing until it leaves at a higher value here at state number two. And then heat is going to be added 
to the unit here, and the hot water is going to be sprayed. Part of it will evaporate and be carried by the air, and the rest will be rejected as brine. On the other hand, air which is, um, which is losing its humidity through condensation is going to leave here at a lower temperature, still saturated air, and the water droplets are going to be col collected all and be uh, taken here as a product. So this is some sort of a, a layout for the system that we have done here. And this is the way that we are writing our, uh, our equations. Uh, what's good about the ES is that you don't have to, uh, to put uh, uh, some sort of a semicolon at the end of every line. You don't have to order the equations sequentially. You can write them in any order. And it is not necessary that uh, the unknown is on the left. But actually, in the left side, you can have some sort of an energy equation like A plus B is equal to C plus D. This is accepted. You don't have to put it in a way that A is equal to B plus D minus C, something like you don't have to do that. So, um, and this gives some flexibility in, in writing. One more thing is, or one benefit uh, out of using the ES is that it has a database that has properties of the materials that we need. Basically, in the HDH system, we are dealing with the air and water. But even the seawater properties, the updated and accurate seawater properties are being included here. So you don't have to worry. You can see here when I'm writing the properties, for example, enthalpy of the air is a function of temperature, relative humidity, and pressure. So I'm, I'm not given the values, but the values are being using uh, or they are using basically the kind of, uh, uh, of of database of property which is there. The data that we have, and instead of putting the mass rate of the water and mass rate of, rate of the air, I'm, I'm writing the MR, which is the ratio, because the mass rate ratio is one of the important parameters that we have for the HDH system. So M dot water over M dot air is an important parameter to take. And I'm assuming M dot water over M dot air here at a certain value, say 2.5. I'm defining how much is the M dot water. And accordingly, M dot air is being calculated automatically from this equation on the top. T minimum is the water temperature entering into the dehumidifier. And in this equation, I'm not, I'm not giving Q. This curly bracket, it means that this line is not being read by the program. So I'm, I'm not given the value of Q. Rather, I'm given the value of T maximum, and Q is going to be calculated as M dot water into CP into the temperature difference. I could have done the program without writing this CP. I can put it as a property, CP as a function of temperature it, it can be given. I'm assuming the values of effectiveness for the dehumidifier and the humidifier as 0 0.7. And you see here, I'm putting the expressions of the effectiveness for the humidifier based on the air side and based on the water side, and I'm taking the maximum value of them. The same thing applies for the dehumidifier as well, effectiveness of the dehumidifier from the air side, from the water side, and I'm taking the maximum value of them. And then the ideal value for the H air in the dehumidifier is being considered here. And the same thing applies for the humidifier is there. So ideal parameters used in determining the maximum enthalpy difference are being given here. And as I mentioned, the, the, the order of writing the equation does not matter. You can write any equation before any equation. What is more important here is that number of equations and number of unknowns is the same. Otherwise, the program will not run. Um, and then uh, anything which is written in curly bracket, brackets, it's a comment. It's not being executed. Anything is related between these quotations is again a comment which is not executed by the program. So if you need to write comments for yourself, you can put it in curly brackets or you can put it into uh, uh, the double quotation that we have here. And then I'm defining T air, uh, phi of the air. Uh, this is the inlet air, it's, it's an open air system. So I'm taking air from the atmosphere. And that's why I'm putting value of phi is equal to 0 0.5. And this is how to use the system properties in calculating enthalpy, humidity ratio, entropy, and density. How to do that? It is simply by getting into the options, function information, and thermodynamic properties, 
and here I'm dealing with air water conditions or air water, uh, which is the humid air. And accordingly, here is the, a list of the properties that we need. Say that I'm looking for the enthalpy. So I need enthalpy of air, water, or humid air. And this should be based on information that I know or I'm going to calculate. So I'm going to put it as a function of temperature, which is dry bulb temperature and uh, relative humidity, which we know that in a couple of locations, relative humidity is 100% and the inlet value, which is atmospheric condition can be given. So this way you can select your properties and put it into the program and don't worry because I might be solving H as a function of temperature where well, still I don't know the temperature, but the way that the program runs, it assumes initial values and then it goes through iterations until conversions is there. So it will assume a value of temperature, calculate the enthalpy, run the equations, calculate new value for the temperatures, compare until it reaches conversion. The program allows us to use arrays as well. So instead of writing for every component, I'm, I'm, roll, I'm doing like a cycle here or um, a loop. Duplicate is like the four next or like the four uh, continue or do continue that we have in Fortran. It's a loop where I'm repeating the calculations of obtaining properties for states number two and three. And then the water properties are being written. The energy and mass balance equations for the humidifier are given here. And for the dehumidifier are given here as well. And this is the edge of the pure water. I'm considering it as H air two plus H air three divided by two. HFG is needed for calculations of the GORD, again, output ratio. The fresh water uh, or the pure water is M dot air into omega two minus omega three. And the brine leaving the dehumidifier is M dot water into M dot fresh water. The GORD is going to be calculated and the product basically is uh, I'm multiplying by 3,600 because I need to see how much is the energy, uh, how much is the water produced per hour. To run the system, we we'll just click on this calculator and it has solved the problem. And here are, this is like, because I selected an array, so the values of the results are given in terms of array here. Water enters at 30 degrees centigrade. This is the cold side temperature in the dehumidifier. It will recover energy. So it will be heat by the hot air. It leaves the unit the dehumidifier at 56 degrees centigrade. It will enter to the humidifier to be sprayed in this temperature uh, where it will lose energy to the air coming and the brine will be rejected at 42 degrees centigrade. Uh, so, sorry, this is the temperature for, uh, for the air. Air is coming to be at 30 degrees centigrade. It will be heated in the humidifier to 56 it will cool down in the dehumidifier and leave at 42 degrees centigrade. Water will enter at low temperature of 30. It will be heated in the dehumidifier through energy recovery to 45 almost. And then it will be heated in the heater to 60. It will be sprayed and cooled down by giving its energy to the air and it will leave as a brine at 34 degrees centigrade. So these are the temperatures. Values of the omega are here, air, at ambient condition, air after being humidified, and then after leaving the dehumidifier. And this is the enthalpy of the water and enthalpy of the air. Then the solution window is given here, where the goal of this system is given as 0.9, and we're getting like six liters per hour of water in this system. And the system needs a heater of 4.4 kilowatts of operation. So this is one way that you can look at, uh, at the system. The freedom that are given to us here with this system is that you can change some of the parameters. What if I used a better uh, humidifier and dehumidifier? I, I should not change both of them at the same time. I'm flexible to change any one at any time. And then you are getting the values and you look at the gore. You see here we got substantially higher gore from 0 0.9 up to 1.8 by just having better components, more effective humidifier and dehumidifier, where the gore has increased, the energy which is needed is less because the temperature of the water which is leaving the dehumidifier, let's look at it, 
which is tea water, it is basically being heated from 30 to almost 50, 20 degrees of energy recovery here. And then you only need to heat it from 50 to 60. And that's why the Q is less. In addition, we're having more water. And this is why the gore has jumped from uh, 0 0.8 to 1 point or 0. Point, uh, or, or maybe 9, 0 0.95 or 9.8 up to 1.8 and the Q has dropped and the fresh water has increased from 6 to 8 liters per hour. So that is basically the benefits of this kind of systems that allows us to uh, run simulations, probably run for a good condition that we can do experimentally and build the system accordingly. Uh, now we reach it for the limit for the, our class time. So I'm going to stop here and then we are going to continue again with the HDH systems in our next class, inshallah. So I'm gonna remain for about uh, maybe a couple of minutes or so if somebody had a question, otherwise uh, you may leave now if you like.